Yeehaw! Time for Networking 101. Get on in here and join me. Hey, if you mastered STP, you're ready to take that spanning tree protocol knowledge to the next level, to the layer three level, then let's go up to OSPF and start looking at how we do this on the routing side of the house, right? Now, look, OSPF is, a, uh, is another hierarchical protocol in, in design in that it has a top level and it does a distributed type of fashion. But because it's layer three, as we're climbing the stack, we can get a little more advanced with it, right? So in the OSPF language, Basically, what you have is you have a top-level router that we call a designated router, or a DR, right? The DR is what actually handles all the updates because it's hierarchical in format. It's the one that sets up to the top and processes and handles and basically sends the topology changes that are going uh, on that network. Now, obviously, since this is a very important device, it's going to have a backup, and we're going to call that backup a BDR. The BDR itself is a backup designated router, and that backup designated router is there just in case this falls offline because since in any type of hierarchical design, no matter what it is, one of the most catastrophic failures you can have is if you lose the brain, right? I mean, it is definitely the most important piece of that network, so it helps to have a backup till we get that going. And because we are designing this network in a hierarchical fashion, it helps, just like with your span tree stuff, to have this be the center of the universe, the place of the network where everything converges to, so you have a little bit better predictability, you get a little bit more accountability, and it understands the flow and the ebb and the tide of what we're going on with the network. Now, OSPF uh, in itself is uh, what we call a link state protocol. And the great thing about OSPF in itself is that when you're looking at the terminology and you're just learning it, don't make it harder than what it is. Oh, trust me, it's going to get a lot more complex uh, as you go on and you start getting to networking 202, 301, and, uh, and the 400 level type stuff. It gets pretty heavy, heavy, heavy duty type stuff, right? But for now, keep in mind that OSPF terminology does what it says it does, right? A DR, a designated router, is just that. It's the boss. It's the top of it. The backup is simply that. It's the backup of the router. OSPF communicates all these changes that are going on the network with what we call an LSA. These LSAs are link state advertisements. Now, link state advertisements themselves um, contain just a variety amount of info on, you know, what the, the, the condition of, of the network is, who just connected, who wants to connect up, uh, those type of things. We actually, in OSPF, we use a term called adjacency, uh, so that when I have a uh, another router, let me go ahead and change to a, a, a groovy color here. If I have a router that wants to join, and it's, it's like, dude, this looks like where the party's happening, the routing party's happening here, let me join up. It's going to say it wants to form an adjacency. It wants to be a part of your grid. And so it's going to send up these LSA joins to try and set up and join that adjacency. And you've got password requirements, you know, that kind of stuff to make sure that we just don't, we don't let everybody in the party here, right? You've got to have an invitation. Um, and so that's what the LSAs do. They're the workhorse. They're the link state advertisement. They advertise what's going on with the, the link. So they're going to tell you everything about how this process works. Now, you know, networking 101s, I, I'm a big history buff. Love to get into the history stuff. Um, this was actually designed back in about the mid 80s, uh, back when, you know, we were wearing parachute pants. And uh, uh, our producer, Steve, he had this really cool flock of seagulls haircut, man. It was jamming in his Trans Am. Uh, but here's the thing this protocol has been so reliable and so rock solid, we've ported it over to IPv6. There is an OSPF v6 out there. There's a multicast uh, version of it, so you can actually use it for multicast. Not as popular. You don't see it as much. People are using other multicast routing protocols, which we'll, we'll cover that later on, uh, but is very, very, very flexible. The algorithm itself, what makes this whole link state uh, piece possible is an algorithm that we actually call Dijkstra, uh, and I'd like to be able to spell that, but I have no idea. It's like DJ Ixcra, I guess. I, it's, it's, it's complicated. I can't spell it, and I'm just not going to uh, bore you with the details. But that's what it's called. Um, it was actually done back in, I believe, 78 um, to actually set this up. But this is really where OSPF gets that power, right? I mean, this is where it truly, honest to goodness, gets to understand the dark side of the networking force is that OSPF, if we're looking at our DR and our BDR up here, we make decisions 
on how the network sends traffic based upon quite a few little variables, right? Um, a few of those can be uh, on, on the hop count itself, right? The hop count is basically how long it takes me or where I got to go to to get information across, right? If I'm on router one and I want to get to router four, how do I get to it in the most efficient way possible? Well, obviously, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't be very efficient to go up and then down and then back up and then back down to get to that way. I want to hop across as quickly as I can. So it behooves me as a designer to reduce hop counts as much as possible. So they also have not only multiple links, but easier shortcuts to get to it um, to, to access how a network can connect up, um, if you will, so that people can really get to get to access the resources they really need as quick as possible in case those links fail. OSPF will count these hops and it will determine that if I want to go from one to four, maybe my quickest path is up here and then down there and boom, I'm, I'm right on target and that's relaxed and groovy. But another cool thing is, is it actually will look at bandwidth too, right? Because even though, let's say that, let me change colors here, uh, that this link here may be my quickest link, might not be my best link. Maybe that link is a satellite link, right? It's a terrestrial link that's going to connect up. And uh, <laughs> if you work with satellite, you know that, uh, that that's truly uh, a last effort type of, of link you want to get to. Uh, but if I'm looking down here on, the tre on, on my land side, um, then maybe what I'm seeing is that, I, that maybe this is three hop counts away by count, one, two, three, uh, but this is all one gigabit. This is more hop counts, but the bandwidth is better, so check, that wins over, and boom, we get across and we can forward that out. And OSPF can calculate a ton of things, right? So maybe if I'm saying that, okay, well, we went ahead and, and bought this company, and they're running uh, RIP, uh, Routing Information Protocol over here. And their devices are so old that we really can't convert them to OSPF. OSPF takes a lot of horsepower. I'm not lying to you. You've got to have some pretty meaty boxes to actually handle it. Um, but they can't run it because they got a bunch of old gear. And, you know, we really don't want to upgrade them either, you know, uh, because they were kind of wanks about the acquisition type stuff. You can actually redistribute RIP into OSPF, and it will act as a like a universal translator, like on Star Trek when you're trying to get through the Klingon territory and stuff. You kind of put it in there and you can get across. Um, it will act as a universal translator and will send that information back and forth so that it knows how to, to talk RIP and turn and convert that back and forth so that my, my network still flows. It works really, really well. That also goes into the calculation as well. There's a bunch of stuff that goes in there that makes that work. And your, your network can continue functioning and delivering this traffic across. OSPF gets, a, get, gets knocked on by being pretty darn complicated. And look, I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, it, it's pretty darn complicated. It's not like BGP. I think BGP is one of the most complicated protocols I've ever worked with. But OSPF is cool. It makes sense, right? It does a lot of things that um, give you a ton of flexibility. If you go to study for exams and stuff, man, make sure you understand LSAs because there's about 15 of them. I think there's like 32, actually. But there's a bunch of them, and they all do all kinds of things. Um, so that, those, that's massive test-taking material, right? Uh, but it's also kind of good to know when you're troubleshooting because you start seeing, you know, type 7 LSAs, you want to know what that means on your network and stuff. Um, so they're, they're really the true heartbeat. They tell you what's going on, the real health and care of, of what that network is all about um, and, and all that stuff. Now, as part of the, the, the history and stuff of Networking 101, I also want to bring your mention up to probably one of the best books uh, on OSPF there is. But understand, Cisco uh, writes a, uh, an OSPF book, probably about 700 pages. It's massive. It's fantastic, though, because, man, it really does dig into a lot of great details uh, on OSPF. But if you want to know the history and you really want to dig in some really cool trivia and what it takes to get a standard through the standards bodies and what the struggle is and some of the trade-offs that were made and that type of stuff, John Moy was a guy who has been with this standard from the early 80s. This is a fantastic book. I love it. I've read it four or five times because this is a great book on basically not only OSPF, but the true anatomy of a routing protocol. And as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to setting up protocols, OSPF is probably one of the coolest protocols there is.